Hi, this is Rhonda Torga, and we are going to be learning today about oxygenation and disorders of the respiratory system. So, we're going to do a little review first, so interpret the following ABGs. So, the following slide is respiratory acidosis with partial compensation and hypoxemia. The pH is an acid, the CO2 is an acid, the bicarb is a base, the PO2 is hypoxic because it's below 80, it is partially compensated because the opposite system is either increased or decreased, and in this case the CO2 is an acid and the bicarb is a base, and also the pH has to be not within normal limits to have partial compensation. So this question is asking you to identify the acid base and then identify the possible reasons for this acid base imbalance. So in this particular problem, We'll do it together. Uh, the pH is 7.31, and that's an acid. The pCO2 is, is 30, and that is a base. The bicarb is 18, and that is an acid. And your PO2 is 74, that is hypoxic. So what does that mean? So it's partially compensated metabolic acidosis with hypoxemia. So your pH is determining that um, it is uh, an acid, and that matches your bicarb, which is also an acid. And then when you have the CO2 and the um, bicarbs are opposite, that means that you have some compensation there, so it's partially compensated. So the etiologies of this uh, Metabolic acidosis could be caused by DKA, lactic acidosis, or renal failure. So in this slide, we're trying to figure out why a patient would receive acetazolamide. So the nurse would suspect that the patient has metabolic alkalosis. Acetazolamide, or Diamox, is classified as a diuretic it causes the body to excrete bicarb. Metabolic alkalosis is caused by increased bicarb intake, which would be an OD on antacids, or increased hydrogen elimination, which would be vomiting or NG desuction. So this question is asking what electrolyte changes are we going to have with acidosis? So in acidosis, we will have hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia. Um, in, in alkalosis, you will have hypokalemia or hypercalcemia. You can remember this by someone is hyper when they're on the drug acid. So that's kind of how I remember it's hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia with acidosis. So a patient has respiratory alkalosis, what are we going to do for them? So respiratory alkalosis caused by a panic attack. The interventions will be brown paper bag, breathing in and out of the bag, um, anxiety medications. We're also going to do teaching to decrease their fear and anxiety. We're going to start now with respiratory failure. Um, the pathophysiology is that ventilation or oxygenation is failing. Um, the etiology for this can be from many causes, including hypoventilation, and that's a decrease in alveolar ventilation. This could be caused by CNS depressants like narcotics or a traumatic brain injury. Um, neuromuscular dysfunction, like spinal cord injury, musculoskeletal dysfunction, like chest trauma. 
The next reason could be intrapulmonary shunting. So the blood is returning to the left atrium without being oxygenated because areas of the lung are inadequately oxygenated. This example would be atelectasis from pneumonia. The next reason would be ventilation or perfusion mismatching. The rate of ventilation is not equaling the rate of perfusion. This can be caused by secretions, which would cause the rate of ventilation to be less than the rate of perfusion, or a pulmonary embolism, which can cause the rate of ventilation to be greater than the rate of perfusion. The last reason can be from diffusion defects. This is the distance between the alveoli and the capillary membrane is increasing because there's a buildup of fluid. Um, and then the cardiac output decreases. So the um, O2 supply um, to the cells is not meeting the demand. This is from lactic acidosis. Or uh, hemoglobin is low, so there is less oxygen delivered to the cell. The focused assessment of acute respiratory failure, um, you will have tachypnea originally, and that will change to bradypnea or apnea, dyspnea, tachycardia. You're going to have LOC changes. Your ABGs will show respiratory acidosis with hypoxemia. Your PaO2 is going to be less than 55, and that's extremely low. Your PaCO2 is going to be greater than 50. Your pH is less than 7.30. And your other assessments will depend on the cause. Treatment of acute respiratory failure is um, with doing endotracheal intubation, which is usually oral. And after two weeks of intubation, they might consider tracheostomy for long-term airway management. Memorize the steps to intubation. Step one is hyperoxygenate with 100% oxygen. Step two, check equipment, the ET tube, and prepare suction. Number three, administer sedative or paralyzing agents. Number four, insert ET tube and inflate cuff. Step five, hyperoxygenate with 100% oxygen and auscultate breath sounds. Number six, secure the ET tube. Number seven, call for x-ray. The ET tube should be two centimeters above the carina. Number eight, restrain patient and check blood pressure. Watch for drop in BP because they may need a bolus. Step nine, attach to ventilator. And just to note, patient is getting breaths via the AMBU bag during all steps except number four when the ET tube is actually inserted and after they are attached to the ventilator. This process will take more than one person. So this is just another picture of the endotracheal tube and where it should be um, two centimeters above the carina. You can see the cricoid, the glottic opening, and the carina in this picture. The purpose of mechanical ventilators is to use positive pressure to force air into lungs. Um, this is some pictures of acute care setting ventilators and home ventilators. So here are just some basic ventilator concepts. The first one is volume. This is the amount of air going in and out. Pressure, amount of pressure used for inhalation and exhalation. Rate, the number of breaths. Flow, time allowed for air going in. Oxygen, amount of supplemental oxygen needed. And this is also called FiO2. 
Then number six, the, the basic ventilator concept is going to be um, to decide when the, the pa if the patient takes a breath or the ventilator takes a breath. The combination of all these concepts um, pre provide different ventilator modes. So these are some of the different ventilator modes. Um, the first one being continuous mandatory ventilation. This is when the ventilator controls all breaths. There's no spontaneous breaths by the patient. It has a preset volume, which is also called tidal volume. The goal is complete rest and the patient will be sedated. The next one is pressure regulated volume control. The pressure, the PRVC, provides volume controlled breaths with the lowest possible pressure by slowing inspiratory flow and time. Adaptive support ventilation adapts to the number of mandatory breaths from the ventilator to the patient's breathing pattern. This is given as a goal. Usual goal is 100 mLs per minute per kilogram. Assist control delivers a preset volume whenever the machine delivers or the patient takes a breath. High risk of hyperventilation and air trapping happen because the patient might be hyperventilating. Um, the rate guarantees a minimum number of breaths to be delivered to the patient, but it doesn't ever top them out at a high rate to stop at. Number five is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, or SIMV. It delivers a preset volume and rate to the patient but also allows the patient to take breaths on their own rate and volume. This is often used for weaning. It shows respiratory therapists how well the patient is going to breathe independently. There's a very low risk of hyperventilation and air trapping with this mode. The rate guarantees a minimum number of breaths to the patient. In pressured controlled ventilation or P CV or PSV, it reflects spontaneous breaths. So the patient receives support through the ventilator of oxygen, PEEP, and pressure um, support. It is also used for weaning. And then there is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, this is non-invasive. Um, it does not need a um, advanced airway, either a trach or an ET tube. You can use this through a nasal or facial mask. And it provides PEEP and or PEEP and pressure support. So there are adjuncts that are used as modes or in conjunction with the modes. The positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, is expiratory pressure support. It adds airway pressure to keep the alveoli open. It is usually five centimeters of water. Um, complications can be hypotension and pneumothorax. Um, and there's a picture of the um, inflation of the alveoli with PEEP and without PEEP. Then pressure support is inspiratory support. It is a preset positive pressure. The range is normally 10 to 20 centimeters of water. This augments the patient's spontaneous volume. It decreases the workload of breathing and patient fatigue during weaning. So I consider this like a splint. So in this slide, I have kind of tried to emulate your notes. 
Um, in the first uh, problem, we have CMV with 14 breaths a minute, a tidal volume of 400, an FiO2 of 30%, and PEEP of 5 centimeters of water. So you have in that box below the ventilator and the patient's breaths. So I have the letter V to represent the ventilator making all the breaths because in CMV, it controls all the breaths and the volume is going all the way up to the 400 mark. And the next one in ASV, we have a goal of 6,000 mLs per minute. Um, and so they've worked that out. It's 400 mLs times 15 breaths per minute. The FiO2 is 30 and the PEEP is 5. So S is representing a spontaneous patient breath. So the first two um, breaths are the patient's, but the second breath doesn't quite get to 400. So the ventilator fills in the volume. And then the patient has a pause, so the ventilator is taking a breath for the patient. In AC, it guarantees breaths at, and a preset volume. And it does, um, it does, uh, depend, it just delivers the um, breaths either in the machine or the patient will, but it's going to get a breath no matter what. So um, in this one, the ventilator has a breath, and then I kind of colored it wrong, I just saw that, and then the, the ventilator has a breath, and it has a small spontaneous breath by the patient but the volume is filled in by the ventilator. So in SIMV, there's 14 breaths per minute. Tidal volume is 14, FiO2 is 30%, PEEP is 10. Um, so the ventilator is taking a breath and then the ventilator takes a breath and then the patient had a spontaneous breath. Spontaneous breath. So in SIMV, it allows the patient's own rate and volume and just adds additional breaths when needed. So this is the one we most often use for weaning. So if your patient is on a ventilator and you're getting report on your patient, these are the things that you should get in report. Um, you'll get the mode, the rate, which is the frequency of breaths, the tidal volume, which is the amount of air usually delivered is uh, 6 to 10 mLs per kilogram, um, the FiO2 or supplemental oxygen, this ranges between 21% and 100%, the PEEP, which is usually 5 centimeters of water, and pressure support, which is usually 10 to 20 centimeters of water. The most common ventilator complications can include barotrauma, which would include pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax. These are treated with a chest tube. You will have unilateral loss of breath sound. So you'd be listening to the breath sounds in all the quadrants of the lung and you will hear no sounds on one side. That is indication you will probably you have a pneumothorax. A next um, complication would be intubation in the right st main stem bronchi. This is very common. Um, it the um, trachea opens up to the right main stem first before it, it branches off to the left lung. Um, so this is a very common thing. The the ET tube will then just have to be adjusted. Um, this is detected during x-ray and also, also during auscultation when the ET tube is put in, you will hear breath sounds on the right side and not the left side. The next complication would be accidental extubation. This is where a patient or an accident would remove the ET tube from the patient um, this can happen because a patient is not restrained properly or not restrained at all, or if they're turned or a procedure is going on where the patient is moved. Just be careful, restrain the patient, make sure you're checking the markings of what 
depth your ET tube is put into. Um, there's little marks on the side and just keep an eye on that um, and be very careful when turning. Tracheal damage, it can be traumatic to have an ET tube placed and then also RT will be measuring the cuff pressures on the ET tube and trach tube to not damage the trachea. Aspiration is another risk. So we elevate the head of the bed, we check gastric residuals, and the patient is placed on a proton pump inhibitor. Also, they can get ventilator-acquired pneumonia, and I will explain this on the next slide. So the best thing to do is prevent ventilator-acquired pneumonia. It can cause your patient's pay to not be paid for by their um, insurance. It will be back, back, put back onto the shoulders of the hospital to pay for that visit. It's in one of those bundles like Clabsy and Cotty where, and patient falls where they are totally preventable and insurances are not paying for those. So um, the most important thing to do and the easiest thing to do is elevate the head of the bed. Of course, you cannot do this with spinal injuries, but there are other things you can do to make sure that the patient does not get VAP, which would include checking gastric residuals, either their NG or G tube. Um, high gastric residuals will increase the risk for aspiration. Decrease the gastric acids, so we will give them PPI like Protonix. Um, Oral care. Oral care is done with chlorhexidine oral solution, not hibiclins or not the chlorhexidine you wash their bodies with, but it is a special mouthwash solution. And it will kill the bacteria in the mouth, which can also cause aspiration. Sterile suctioning. It's very important to suction even the mouth um, of the patient on a ventilator um, when we use the inline suctioning, which would be um, sterile suctioning, it is going down the trach or the ET tube, and that goes down to the or beginning of the lungs. We also need to suction inside the mouth because those type, the saliva and bacteria can grow and it accumulates above the cuff of the ET tube or the trach. So that is also important to suction there. Another way to prevent VAP is change vent tubing. This is done by RT, but you can always mention if things are not looking clean. Um, and also very good trach care is an important thing to do to prevent VAP. Ventilator alarms. It's very important not just to silence alarms. They're happening for a reason and our alarms should tell us something. Note that if the alarms are going off, the volume of air is not getting into your patient's lungs, so they will not be adequately ventilated. The first alarm we'll talk about is the low volume alarm. Low means air is escaping. Um, this could be due to disconnected tubing or low cuff pressures. The second reason is high pressure alarm. This means resistance. So this could be secretions. If there's secretions in the way of the airflow, the air will not get into the patient's lungs and it will cause a high pressure alarm. If the patient is biting the ET tube, the machine will not be able to get the air into the patient and it will set off the high pressure alarm. Also, if there is a kink in the tubing and if your patient is coughing, Coughing is actually increasing the pressure into the in the lungs, and this will also cause a high pressure alarm. Weaning is a process that takes a patient from the vent from uh, being on the ventilator to off the ventilator completely. It is individualized and is dependent on the MD, the RT, and the patient. Usually a patient starts on a more ventilator controlled mode like CMV and AC. Then the patient moves to a more 
patient controlled mode like ASV and SIMV. They also might have just pressure support trials. Then they're extubated um, and, and put onto oxygen, or if they have a trach, they will do trach collar trials, which where they're on just a trach collar with humidity and, and oxygen. Eventually their, trug, their trach may be plugged, and then eventually they're decannulated. We're now going to learn how to interpret AVGs and then adjust ventilator settings. So in this one, just figure out what your AVGs are doing first. So this patient actually has normal AVGs, but those are still something you need to learn fix or to recognize. So there is no fix to the ventilator settings. They are doing well. This patient has the CMV mode, which is control, total control, so they can have rest. Their rate is 10. Their FiO2, or supplemental oxygen, is at 40%, and their PEEP is 5. If we were going to change something, it would only be the rate or the FiO2 and nursing would just suggest changes to the MD or RT. Uh, we do not change our settings for our patient. So interpret the ABGs first and then determine what you think you might need to change on those ventilator settings based on those results. So this patient has respiratory acidosis they are not compensated. So what are we gonna to do to the settings? So the only things, like I said, we can change or suggest change, the changes to, are the rate and the supplemental oxygen. So this patient has respiratory acidosis. So what do we know about respiratory acidosis? We know that the patient is not breathing enough. So we can suggest an increase of rate. The next thing we look at is what do they need more or less oxygen? So the patient's PaO2 was 72. Does that fall between 80 and 100? No, it doesn't. So they're hypoxic. We don't want them to be hypoxic. So we are going to suggest an increase in oxygen. On this slide, I need you to interpret the ABGs and think about what ventilator settings would need to be changed for this patient. So this patient has respiratory alkalosis. It is partially compensated because the base or the PCO2 is a base and the bicarb is an acid but it's only partially compensated because that pH is not within normal limits. And it is alkalosis because that matches the respiratory part of the acid-base imbalance. So they are also hypoxic. So what are we gonna do? So for the rate, what do we know about patients with respiratory alkalosis? What are they doing with their breathing? They're breathing too fast. So we will suggest the rate be decreased. Also, this patient's hypoxic. Normal is 80 to 100, so we want them to be in that. So their, O2, o, um, their oxygen needs to be increased. So these are some of the medications for patients on the ventilator. Um, this would include beta-2 agonists for bronchodilation, this would include albuterol and Ventolin. Also, anticholinergics for bronchodilation. This is um, iatropopium bromide or Atrovent. Often these two medications, albuterol and Atrovent, are put together in a, nebulizer, a nebulized solution and um, given to the patient on the vent and is called Duoneb. 
There are steroids given oftentimes for an anti-inflammatory effect. This could be prednisone, which is given in the NG or G tube, or IV solumedrol. Sedation is often given for comfort, like lorazepam or Ativan. Um, morphine or propofol are also given. Before you move on to this next diagnosis, make sure that you review the care plan for the patient on a ventilator. So next we're going to talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS or acute lung injury. So basically there is a lung injury followed by respiratory distress with profound dyspnea and tachypnea and they also have refractory hypoxemia. This is hypoxemia that does not respond to oxygen therapy. So the pathology or pathophysiology of ARDS is basically injury, then it goes to inflammation, that a VLI capillary membrane is injured, which results in pulmonary edema, small airway closure, decreased surfactant, and that's atelectasis, and then stiff, non-compliant lungs. They're very hard to ventilate. The etiology of ARDS is caused by intrinsic injuries or extrinsic injuries. Intrinsic injuries are conditions within the body, um, one being sepsis, uh, another being PE or pulmonary embolism, shock or pancreatitis. Um, extrinsic injuries are conditions coming from the outside, which would include aspiration or inhalation injuries. So the signs and symptoms of ARDS usually occur within the first 72 hours of the initial inju injury. Um, the respiratory distress, which will be displayed as tachypnea, dyspnea, and tachycardia. The refractory hypoxemia, this happens from shunting. There is a decrease in lung compliance. The lungs are stiff and difficult to ventilate. Just remember, if they're on the vent, you're going to have high pressure alarms because they are unable to um, have normal tidal volumes. The diagnostic testing for ARDS initially will be an x-ray. Your um, first x-ray when your patient first gets there, it may be normal, but after 24 hours, the x-rays will show white out or diffuse alveolar infiltrates. Basically, that's all that fluid. Um, we also need to rule out MI um, versus ARDS by doing a BNP and an EKG. If it is ARDS, your BNP will be less than 100 and your EKG will be normal. The plan of care for ARDS is, um, begins with care is supportive. There is no cure for ARDS. Um, basically, we just support the patient as they heal on their own. The goal of care is to decrease oxygen consumption and decrease oxygen needs. The mortality rate is 26 to 58%. Um, they have endotracheal intubation with mechanical ventilation with PEEP. The FiO2 is increased to maintain a PO2, PaO2 of 60 um, or higher, the SaO2 greater than 90%, the tidal volumes are going to be small, so that will only be 4 to 8 milliliters per kilogram. This is because that expansion problem and they are very stiff. The PEEP, however, is going to be increased um, to 10 to 15. It is increased in small amounts and we need to listen for pneumothoraxes. Um, 
Also, high-frequency oscillatory ventilation is used. They use low tidal volumes and constant airway pressures with a high respiratory rate. This improves oxygenation and ventilation without the trauma caused by the inflate-deflate cycle. Pressure control with inspiration is going to be greater than expiration. This helps keep the VLI open longer. Patients with ARDS are often given neuromuscular blocking agents or paralytic agents um, so that they don't um, fight the machine or the ventilators and they can have complete rest. Some of the common names are rocuronium, pancuronium, and netcuronium. Remember that the patient retains sensations. They can't move, they are paralyzed, but they are awake and they're able to feel and they're able to hear. They cannot blink and this puts them at risk for corneal abrasions. They're dependent on the nurse for all their care and they have immobility risks. And they're on a ventilator and make sure all the alarms are on. Peripheral nerve stimulators um, using the train of four. So peripheral nerve stimulators are used when a patient is on a paralytic agent to ensure that they're adequately paralyzed. So the first thing the nurse will do is attach two electrodes two centimeters apart along the ulnar or facial nerve path, and I've shown two pictures of this. They're going to deliver four consecutive electrical stimuli, and then they're going to watch for thumb or facial movement or twitches, and this is the train of four response, which is a twitch. So if they deliver four um, electrical stimuli and there's four contractions, they are under paralyzed. If they deliver four electrical stimuli and there are three contractions, they are still under paralyzed. If they deliver four electrical stimuli and there are two contractions, this is acceptable. And if they deliver four electrical stimuli and there is one contraction, this is also acceptable. If they deliver the four electrical stimuli and there are zero contractions, the patient is over paralyzed. And this means that 100% of the, of the receptors are blocked and they will need to back off that um, paralytic agent. Other medications that patients are given while they're on the vent with ARDS include sedatives, and these can be lorazepam, midazolam, or versed, um, propofol, and analgesics, including morphine and fentanyl, and corticosteroids. The corticosteroids actually help augment the fight or flight um, because the adrenal glands may be giving up or not working quite as well. So this can help. Um, and then they can also increase blood glucose. So um, AccuCheck's will need to be done. Prone positioning is done um, during ARDS because dependent secretions um, are uh, causing more damage. So to increase the perfusion to the less damaged lung, it'll increase their oxygenation. And so you place the patient on their abdomen with pillows or positioners that help the belly to hang down, kind of between the two um, positioners. And this will uh, allow for the lungs to expand even further and um, increase your oxygenation. I have some pictures at the bottom. So one thing we have to worry about with oxygen is oxygen toxicity. Um, this can cause um, adverse symptoms in the nervous, central nervous system, including, 
dizziness, tingling, seizures, and hyperventilation. In the pulmonary system, it can cause dyspnea and cough and actually burning in the airway. And in the eyes, it can cause cataract formation and retinal edema. Um, oxygen toxicity is caused by having a patient on uh, oxygen concentrator or concentration greater than 50%. Um, it also depends on the duration of oxygen therapy, especially if it's greater than 48 hours. Also, the degree of lung disease before oxygen therapy will increase their risk for oxygen toxicity. So this is like patients with CF or COPD. If a patient is on greater than 50% for 48 hours, patients are susceptible. So the best thing to do is prevent oxygen toxicity, and this can be done by choosing the lowest oxygen setting to prevent hypoxemia. Um, using PEEP and pressure support to increase oxygenation and using aggressive pulmonary hygiene. This would include suctioning, bronchodilators, and steroids. So now we're gonna learn how to convert a patient from an oxygen mask to a nasal cannula. So just remember room air is equal to 20% of oxygen. And every liter of nasal cannula oxygen is equal to 4% oxygen. So we have two problems here. The first one is the patient has a 36% mask. How many liters per minute a nasal cannula would that be? So we're gonna take 36, we're gonna minus 20. The 20 is the room air, because 36 would be the total oxygen that that patient's receiving. So 36 minus 20 is 16. This is the supplemental oxygen needed. Um, so 16 divided by 4%, which is 4% for every liter of nasal cannula, it will be four liters per minute nasal cannula. The next one is 40% mask. So we're gonna automatically take away 20 the patient has a total of 20% supplemental oxygen needed. Um, it's 20% divided by four liters, or 4%, or 4%, which is each liter of oxygen equals 4%. So it's 20 divided by four equals five, and they have five liters per minute nasal cannula. So more oxygen precautions. So, Oxygen is combustible. It will catch fire. So you have to be careful what you use around oxygen. Smoking is definitely prohibited. Um, also, open flames like on a gas stove are also prohibited. Um, make sure electrical equipment is grounded. Avoid flammable products like hairspray and petroleum products. Um, remember that patients may be susceptible to oxygen-induced hypoventilation. This is when patients are on too high of an oxygen flow and it stops the drive to breathe, which often happens with COPD, where we need to make sure that they don't get to be 100% on their oxygen because their bodies need to keep it a little lower. So physicians will usually say their range would be 88 to 95. Um, it also causes drying of mucous membranes. Um, this can cause nosebleeds, um, sore noses, sore throats, um, and then it in, um, can set them up for infections um, by pseudomonas. Um, this is actually a a normal flora that's in your airway, but when you have dry mucous membranes and um, open areas, it can go into your bloodstream and cause infection. So just a little refresher on tracheostomies. Make sure you're using warm, filtered air with humidity. 
Um, the trach does not receive that warm air automatically like our nose does for our um, trachea. So our nose is the one that's warming that air, um, making sure it's filtered with the cilia that's in our nose and it also adds humidity in our nasal passages. So we have to create that artificially. Um, trach tubes are a long-term airway management. This is usually something that's planned for months to years. Um, you always keep a spare at the bedside, ready to go if it's dislodged or obstructed. You're going to prevent complications like hemorrhage, infection, tube in obstruction, tube dislodgement, tracheal stenosis, and tracheoesophageal fistula. Suctioning is only 10 to 15 seconds. We only suction on the way out. We make sure we hyperoxygenate first. Um, it's preferable to use a sterile inline catheter if you are having the patient on the vent and make sure you're using saline to clear the suction catheter. The next respiratory disorder we're going to cover is pulmonary embolism. The pathology of a pulmonary embolism is a blood clot from a DVT or deep vein thrombosis breaks loose. It travels and lodges in the branch of the pulmonary artery system. Um, the clot secretes serotonin and thromboxane A2. There is vasoconstriction and bronchoconstriction that occurs in that lung. There is a decrease in ventilation and a decrease in perfusion. The risk factors for pulmonary embolisms are any risks that are risk for DVTs, including immobility, surgery, which would include ortho, pelvic, gynecological, abdomen. Those are um, ones that have increased risk for DVT. Um, patients with altered coagulability, um, patients that take estrogen or on birth control pills, anyone with um, uterine, ovarian, or prostate cancers. Lung cancers also cause this. Um, foreign objects, so things from an IV catheter that get dislodged, um, injected particles, um, atrial fibrillation is a cause of, of P DVTs or PEs, um, and sepsis. This is a bacterial invasion of a thrombus. So what are the signs of a DVT that you remember? Here's our picture of our lady that, or man, I think it's a lady, it's, I see pink, um, that has a DVT. See that very large difference in the legs. Um, so it's warm, I think it's warm anyways. It's red, swollen, and it's unilateral. So one's normal, one's not normal. Um, we're going to measure the circumference and we'll test it for a positive Hohmann sign. So the signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism is a dyspnea of sudden onset. There's increased respiratory rate and heart rate. Your ABGs will show respiratory acidosis. Uh, this actually indicates late respiratory failure, um, fear and impending doom. And they'll also have the signs and symptoms of a DVT. And the severity of these symptoms will depend on the size of the clot. So some of the tests for pulmonary emb embolism um, include a spiral CT, a multi-detector computer to tomography angiography, um, pulmonary angiography, or ventilation perfusion scan, the D-dimer is pretty much standard. If it is negative, there is no PE. Um, the Doppler studies are done to assess for DVTs and to uh, confirm their presence. Chest x-rays also help determine if there is a PE. 
And we also want to rule out an MI with X-ray, cardiac enzymes, and EKG. So we could prevent PEs by using TED hose, compression hose, um, sequential compression devices, getting patients up um, as soon as possible after surgery, um, leg exercises for bed-bound patients, and prophylactic anticoagulant therapy. So on this slide, I have um, all of the anticoagulant drugs, including one for thrombolytic therapy. So um, basically, the first um, four are pills um, that people can take to um, stay anticoagulated and prevent PEs. Um, Lovenox and um, Atrixtra are in new injections um, that can also treat as well as prevent PEs. Um, thrombolytic therapy um, can actually treat PEs by um, busting their clots. Um, it, decree it converts plasminogen to plasmin, which degrades the fibrin in clots. And this is TPA. Heparin drips are often used at um, PEs uh, to decrease the size of it or to help bridge to Coumadin therapy. Um, so we're going to need to know the labs for heparin infusion therapy. The first being APTT. The normal is 21 to 35 seconds. Um, the therapeutic is two to three times the control. So that would be 42 to 87. Critical is greater than 100. So normal bolus dose um, when starting heparin therapy is 70 to 80 units per kilogram. And this is um, given rapidly, followed by an infusion of 17 to 18 units per kilogram per hour. And you will just basically be following a protocol um, given by uh, the pharmacy for your patient based on their weight. The antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate, but generally we just stop the heparin and usually within four hours it has gone down quite a bit, has a very short half-life. Warfarin or Coumadin, yeah, this is used, it's cheap. Um, and it is still used as an um, anticoagulant. So INR normal is one, therapeutic is two to three, and it is critical um, greater than 3.5. The antidote is vitamin K. Um, often they just usually stop it for one to two days, but vitamin K is given for emergencies or if it's critically high. And um, Often it is given before surgery so patients can have emergency surgery. So when a patient has a DVT or they're prone to clots and anticoagulants are in, contraindicated, they will get a vena cava filter. This is done in interventional radiology. It's placed in the inferior vena cava because it's a large vein that returns the blood from the pelvis and lower extremities to the heart. And you can see uh, the demonstration of this in the picture. Lung cancer, we're gonna talk about that now. So lung cancer has the leading cause of ca cancer deaths because of metastasis. Um, the typical patient is 65 years old and in stage three to four when they find out they have the cancer. Um, the risk factors are, the number one is smokers. They have 85% of all lung cancer deaths. Um, another risk factor is workplace exposure like asbestos or other carcinogens. Um, environmental um, Risk factors can be air pollution or radon. There can be family history and diet and obesity also contribute. The important thing to understand in lung cancers, the symptoms occur 
secondary to obstruction. So that tumor is obstructing the airway and obstructing perfusion in the lung. So cough is the number one change. So it's usually a change in a chronic cough or a new persistent cough is the first symptom that people notice. Dyspnea, trouble going upstairs, losing their breath with activity. Um, then sputum um, that's blood tinged or purulent. Um, weight loss, this can be significant because when we decrease our efficiency of uh, ventilation and oxygenation, we tend to have weight loss because our body's working harder to ventilate our, our lungs. Um, so they're usually diagnosed with a chest x-ray, a CT scan, and biopsies. So a percutaneous bronchoscopy with biopsy is one way that a biopsy is done. Um, remember that to prepare your patient for this, they need to get a consent. They need to be MPO for four to eight hour, four to eight hours. Um, make sure the dentures are removed because it goes into the mouth. Um, you teach them about the medications and what is going to happen during the procedure. Intraoperatively, they will use a local anesthesia that's a spray on the back of the throat and it numbs the throat. Um, that's often if they use a flexible bronchoscopy. They also may give like a light sedation, like Verse said. Um, then if it's a general anesthesia, they will um, do, a, they do rigid bronchs and those are done into the OR. Postoperatively, we need to make sure we wait for that cough reflux to return before the patient eats or drinks. Um, we need to monitor the respiration and blood pressure. A small amount of blood is okay, and a temp may be higher than normal for the first 24 hours. Um, we need to make sure they report any increased shortness of breath and bleeding. So the next type of biopsy would be a percutaneous fine needle biopsy under CT guidance. So this is coming from outside the body through the chest wall. So we need to make sure in preparation that consent is done and that we teach the patient about what's going to happen because they're going to be an active participant in this one. Um, the meds, they might get something very, very light um, like a volume just to help take the edge off their anxiety, but probably not too much. Um, externally, they may numb the area that they um, put the biopsy needle in, but it is a very small needle, um, so they may just do like a local anesthetic around that area. Um, Intraoperatively, um, they're going to have to hold their breath mid exhalation. So it's really important that they can follow directions so they will not be sedated. Um, so they hold their breath mid exhalation when the needle goes in for the biopsy. Postoperatively, they need to monitor their um, respiration rates, their blood pressure. The discharge instructions are to report increased shortness of breath bleeding or infection at the site. Lung cancer surgery, we're gonna learn about three different kinds. The first one is a wedge resection. It is localized, it removes a small portion of a lobe um, and it's peripheral usually. It does require a chest tube because it's opening um, the lung to the outside area and the chest tube will then be placed to block that open airway. The next one is a lobectomy, and that's where an entire lobe is removed. This is popular for small curable tumors. It does require a chest tube because it's leaving, again, um, bronchioles and um, open to air, um, so it will require a chest tube. Um, then there's pneumonectomy. It's an entire lung. The bronchus is actually sutured close and no chest tube is needed. So post-op care lung surgery. 
So the nursing diagnosis would be impaired gas exchange related to decreased lung tissue. So they're going to receive oxygen and be in a Fowler's position. We're going to main chest tube systems in the case of a lobectomy and wedge resection. We're going to have them up, and if they're in bed, we're going to turn them every two hours. Um, for pain related to tissue and nerve trauma, we're going to splint with a pillow, um, and we can give opioid analgesics, but we need to make sure we watch for respiratory depression. They often may get intrathecal or epidural analgesia. For post-op, specifically for pneumonectomy, we will turn them every two hours, but it will depend on MD order if it starts 24 hours post-op or right away. Sometimes we will just keep them off the side that the lung was removed. And remember, there's no chest tube with a pneumonectomy. Radiation that's done for lung cancer is usually done to shrink the tumor before surgery. It's done daily for five to six weeks. Um, the teaching for the patients would be to not wash off the markings. They're used to locate where to direct the radiation. Um, we have them only use prescribed ointments and avoid petroleum products. Avoid the sun for at least a year and watch for signs and symptoms of esophagitis because anywhere within the beam can have um, effects and that often includes um, the esophagus, sometimes also the intestines. So palliative care for the patient with lung cancer. So we're going to provide oxygen. They may or may not be hypoxic, but sometimes it just helps them to feel better. We're going to give them bronchodilators to open up the airway to give them as much oxygenation and expansion as possible. We may offer radiation to shrink the tumor for the relief of symptoms caused by obstruction. They also may have thoracentesis and pleurodesis. Um, they remove the fluid from the interpleural space. They instill a sclerosing agent that causes inflammation causing the pleura to adhere to the chest wall so that um, pleural space isn't repeatedly filling up with fluid. So just a reminder to review atrial and junctional rhythms on the PowerPoint and the EKG module. That is what you're supposed to be um, learning this week. Also review chest tubes. Um, go to Lippincott Advisor. Um, then go to nursing, curriculum concepts, chest drainage. Then I need you to review the different kinds of chest tubes, why chest tubes are needed, and how to manage care for patients. Ventilator changes based on ABG results. If your pH is less than 7.3 and your CO2 is greater than 45, you're going to have a respiratory acidosis. And we know in respiratory acidosis, we have hypoventilation. So we're going to suggest to the doctor that we increase the amount, amounts of time they're breathing per minute. And a pH greater than 7.45 and our CO2 less than 35, we're going to have respiratory alkalosis. Um, they're going to have hyperventilation, so we're going to su suggest they have a decrease um, breaths per minute. If their PaO2 is less than 80, we're going to suggest an increase of the oxygen. And if our PaO2 two is greater than 100, we're going to suggest it go be decreased because we don't want it to be above 100. Our range is 80 to 100. Um, can they have both at the same time? Are we going to have to increase rate and increase oxygen at the same time? Absolutely. So um, both of those are a possibility. And we're going to practice that. Is there some practice scenarios in your homework? Really quick, hopefully you just have to memorize that page in the note about the different ventilator settings. They are confusing. Try to highlight the same things and highlight the differences and try to memorize it that way. 
But the big difference between AC and ASV, ASV adapts, that's in the name, right? Adapts to the patient's own breathing pattern, but it guarantees a set volume per minute. And AC is control. It controls those breaths um, and the ventilator will always, or the patient's breath will always have a minimum amount of breaths and all have the same volume. So just kind of remember the title of it. So ASV adapts and AC controls. So that's the big difference there. Checking gastric residuals, we should check them every four hours via OG, NG, G-tube. Volumes greater than 250 mLs can increase your possibility of refluxing or vomiting stomach contents, and they could go in the lungs, so it increases your risk for aspiration, which aspiration can cause VAP, right? Um, I've also included a nice little video on inline suctioning. There's lots of different devices, but this one closely looked like the one in our sim lab. So I added that. How do we suction? Um, we only suction as we remove. That's how I was taught. Um, some places do intermittent suctioning where you're going to put your thumb and your finger together and like rapid little, little bursts. Sometimes we just all, um, push down and suction the whole time. It's all based on what your unit has as a preference. Um, for our purposes, excessive vomiting will cause metabolic alkalosis. Some people were confused because metabolic acidosis can have vomiting. What well, a lot of those conditions do have vomiting, like DKA, they vomit. That's not the cause, that's not causing the metabolic acidosis. What's causing the metabolic acidosis is the DKA. Um, metabolic alkalosis can and will be caused by excessive vomiting. Remember, it's going to be excessive. Trapped air, what is it? It refers to the retention of excess gas or air and all or part of the lung, especially during expiration. Many conditions can cause trapped air in small airways. Um, small amounts of it will be normal and not cause any problems. But it can also be caused by obstruction, inflammation, or scarring. Um, it could be due to positioning, mucus, obesity, or for foreign bodies. <clears throat> Medications, if it's found in your note, it's fair game for the test. And next week, we're going to go over meds again. We have an in-class activity we're going to do. But when you think about memorizing drugs, think of SOC. You need to know the side effects. Um, organs, where does it work in the body? What's it for? C is class, class or considerations. And K is no, the must, no points. So those are the important indications or warnings. Um, EKGs are tested in clinical. The perfusion tests and the ACLS module um, has some on their exams. But in the first test, we do not test on EKGs. Where to start measuring the ET tube so we know where it is. Um, the ET tube is measured from the distal end of the tube and is typically marked in two centimeter increments. After successfully intubating the patient, the depth of the endotracheal tube ending at the teeth or lips, it's going to be noted. So depending on your facility, they should specify, but always clarify what you're measuring from. So that might be a good clarifying question to ask your nurse that you're getting a report from. Um, how much oxygen does a non-rebreather deliver? Well, it can deliver um, between 60% to 80% at a flow rate of 10 to 15 liters. It needs at least 10 liters to fill up the bag part of the non-rebreather, and that's important for the actual um, device to function. So that's how much oxygen they're getting. Um, what causes decreased lung compliance? Easy answer, decreased surfactant and damage to alveoli. 
that's kind of our very outermost part of our lung and it is it covers the largest surface area of our lung so when those are damaged and when surfactant is gone um, we're going to have decreased lung compliance what is the f in fio2 sounds like a fun title um, so it means fraction of inspired oxygen that's what it stands for it's the concentration of oxygen in a gas mixture. You know our air is not just oxygen that we breathe. Um, so the gas mixture at room air has a fraction of inspired oxygen of 21%, meaning that the concentration of oxygen at room air is 21%. I'm not testing over that, but that's what that means. Um, for exams um, in class, if your computer has difficulty holding a charge, here's what I suggest. Arrive early, get by a plug, bring an extension cord or a power strip, purchase a backup battery if that's an option. I don't know, some computers are weird about that, but those are what I'm going to say to you. I am getting some um, power strips and extension cords, but I can only provide so many. So we only have like four uh, maybe five outlets. So um, we'll try to do the best we can. All right, there's a clock in a room and it's not fixed and uh, this is in 113. It's an hour behind. I have told someone and hopefully get it fixed. Um, and then uh, does a trach prevent VAP? Nope, it's just invasive, just as invasive as an ET tube. I'm assuming that you meant that a trach that's hooked up to a ventilator, it's just as likely to expose a patient to um, the same pitfalls of VAP as an ET tube. Um, you must be on a vent to get VAP, right? So they kind of have the same situation going on. Converting oxygen mass to nasal cannula. So room air for our math purposes is 20%. I picked that because it's easy to round and we're not gonna give like three fourths of a liter. So um, it just kind of helps us keep nice even numbers. Um, each liter of nasal cannula oxygen is 4% oxygen. So we're n we know that we're gonna use that number four a lot. So, um, so basically the formula is total percent of oxygen the patient is on in a mask minus room air um, divided by four, okay? So the four is the four percent, which equals one liter of oxygen. So we have 40 minus 20, because our patient has 40% oxygen minus the 20%, which is room air, and that equals 20. And we're going to divide that by 4 because each liter of oxygen is equal to 4%. And we get 5 liters. That is how we know to put them on 5 liters of nasal cannula. Iatropropium bromide, why would we use an anticholinergic? It's actually an anticholinergic bronchodilator. And it basically calms those smooth muscles in the airway and it prevents bronchospasm. Um, PEEP, that's positive in expiratory pressure. It keeps just amount of air in the alveoli so they don't collapse on expiration. So it's expiratory and pressure support. It's inspiratory help. It keeps the airway open and helps if muscles are weak. Um, for patients who are hyperventilating, we should try to calm them down with our voice. Yes, talk them down. I know in mental health, you might have been told otherwise, but we need to try to at least get them to calm or slow their breathing. If they don't, they end up passing out um, and that can cause a fall and we don't want falls. Those are just as bad as Clabsy, Cotty, and VAP. What is the risk of over paralyzation with a paralytic drug? I found out it's permanent nerve damage and risk for permanent um, paralyzation. Um, also, um, they can have um, a weakness associated with it long after their um, ICU stay.